welcome. Tell us who you are and what you do. I'm Leonardo Bonanni. I'm a visiting scientist at the MIT Media Lab, where I got my PhD. I teach at Columbia, uh, but my day job is uh, founder uh, and CEO of SourceMap, which is a startup based in New York. Tell us about the course you'd like to highlight for us that you teach. The class I've been teaching for the last six or seven years at, at MIT and Columbia is called uh, Future Craft, uh, Radical Sustainability for uh, Products and Ventures. Uh, basically, we bring together uh, business students and uh, engineering and design students, and we have them propose new products or new ways of doing business that are fundamentally more sustainable. Uh, we call it radical sustainability uh, than the way things are done today. Describe us, for us, what is radical sustainability? Well, radical is the root, right? It's it's what's essential, and and sustainability is essentially about continuing about going on. I think in French it's, it's durable. Um, uh, so when we use radical sustainability we're saying well it's not enough to just maintain the standard of living of the developed world. Now, that's a very low bar to set and it's not enough to recycle here and use a little bit less material there. We have to come up with a new way of addressing the world's needs uh, and that means the four billion people who don't live uh, in the developed world will need access to fuel and transportation and uh, clothing and, and, and uh, housing. And, and thinking about how to feed the entire world, uh, how to grow together, uh, that's radical sustainability. And it's a completely uh, disruptive way of coming up with businesses and products. Is this notion of radical sustainability not only for the benefit of the planet, but also for the benefit of making things happen and people move? Radical sustainability is a, a, a provocation. Right? There are tremendous number of innovations if you radically rethink business models themselves. Uh, so we're saying forget how products are manufactured, forget how services are delivered, uh, and just rethink from scratch uh, along the lines of some of the new economies that we see coming out in the world today. Uh, so we're really trying to provoke people to, to realize that business as usual is dying, and that only completely new models are going to thrive in this new economy. Thinking about your students, Leo, and your, and your course, what are the, the key messages or the key message that you want them to take away at the end? What we're trying to do is basically highlight the opportunities of thinking sustainably. So uh, we've innovated uh, almost to the limits of how much we can improve uh, life in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, but if you take life in uh, West Africa or Indonesia or uh, the north of Brazil and you look at how much room there is for improvement, it's just massive. And so it's like a very low-hanging fruit for innovation. Right? We know that we can make a huge difference if we can just get light and water and, and food to, uh, to the bottom of the pyramid. And that's what we're really provoking people to do. You mentioned, Leo, that you bring business people and sustainable together in the same room. So this leads me to think about creating collaborations with people with different viewpoints. How do you manage that and how do you encourage that? You know, from the outset, uh, we recognize that even if you work for a big company, you're going to increasingly be in an entrepreneurial role. You're going to be advocating for projects and ideas uh, and creating your own teams within that company and bringing those projects to the attention of leadership. Uh, to, to, to get them funded. And so we are assuming that whether you go off on your own or you go into a multinational, you need to know how to pitch uh, and develop uh, an idea from nothing to something fundable. And, and we assume that every one of those teams is going to be multidisciplinary. Some design, some engineering, and some business. Uh, so we uh, take an even proportion of architects and designers, electrical and mechanical engineers, and business students and they naturally gravitate towards each other because each has a skill uh, and, and usually you need a little bit of, of all three. You need the, uh, the designer to, to provoke and to create a pretty picture that people want to believe in. Uh, you need the engineers to back it up that it can actually be built. Uh, and then you need uh, the business people to, to put the numbers down so that uh, they can prove that it can be funded. And the students either uh, pitch the project uh, to a crowdfunding website like an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter, uh, if it's appropriate, or they take it to one of the many uh, business uh, pitch competitions that you have on the East Coast, and they actually have to propose it as a startup and see if it can get interest from, uh, from investors. 
What types of mechanics or processes do you put in place in order for the confrontation and or collaboration to happen? Well, there's a number of icebreaker exercises. We really want teams that are mission aligned. Uh, another uh, big HR uh, direction these days, our companies have to have a mission and they're going to attract talent with that mission. So we have an icebreaker uh, that I call the product autopsy. Every independent student uh, takes a, chooses a product, disassembles it, and explains in, in his or her terms uh, what the impact of that product is in, in a good way, uh, creating jobs, making life easier, and, and in a bad way, environmentally, uh, socially uh, impactful. So, uh, so we take those icebreakers, the, this product autopsy, and it's really a way to s for students to see who thinks like them. Uh, people will gravitate towards certain kinds of products or certain kinds of issues uh, and then they team up uh, for their second assignment which is to radically rethink that product in terms of a, a new product or maybe not a product maybe a new service. What's the place of innovation in your course? In, in this course there's no excuse not, not to be innovative. In fact you have to Google everything you do before you even present it. If it's been done it's not allowed. Most of the projects have to demonstrate social or environmental or economic benefit or ideally all three. What's the place of technology in that space? Technology is not a requirement for radical sustainability. Uh, in past years I've actually assigned de-technologizing as one of the sources of innovation. If you take an existing highly technological solution and try to strip away as much of, of the electronics and the robotics from it as possible and you can still achieve more or less the same end then you've probably done something that's much more accessible to the rest of the world. You talk about uh, the triple bottom line when you look at sustainable development projects. Can you tell us more about how and why you evaluate projects in that way? For years companies have been measuring the financial bottom line, the profit and loss, the balance sheet and if you think about the number of services and, and uh, tools that are available for a company to accurately measure its financial performance. It's, it's actually pretty impressive. Now if you look at the environmental or the social impact of a company, it is very difficult to get uh, uh, accurate, dependable, uh, reliable numbers on those impacts. So one of the first things we do is introduce triple bottom line accounting, which means that uh, you can imagine three bottom lines, the financial, the social, and the environmental. Uh, now, this is totally new and out of the box, so there are no accepted global standards, but uh, the, the leading companies, the, the sort of pioneers, the early adopters, have proposed ways that you can measure whether a new product creates jobs, you know, improves livelihoods, you can measure whether it uh, releases toxic chemicals or whether it, it, it contributes to global warming. So, so there are these indices. We're just inserting uh, a few tools so that students can measure their innovations based on all three criteria. In the end of the day, what you're saying is this triple bottom line in itself is a little innovative, is an innovation by itself. Well, that's right. But if you look at all uh, financial and quality metrics, right, those were only developed in the last few decades. So Six Sigma, you know, just in time. Now, these are new metrics and companies that developed new benchmarks before their competition usually one and, and we're doing the same thing for social and environmental and we see it happen with with customers that I work with at my company every day those who can quantify social and environmental risk before their competitors are ahead of the game and have a more sustainable business what sort of emerging business models do, are you seeing in the sustainable space the biggest sustainable business models aren't even called sustainable uh, the, the most sustainable business models that we've seen r recently are the shared economy, are uh, telepresence. Uh, these are just uh, just a matter of course. These are just they just make sense. More function, less resources. Uh, but then we also see some of the, the the most radically sustainable business models, like the circular economy or the cradle to cradle uh, pursuit, also finally uh, taking off. And so we we bring together a series of case studies of companies that have built their entire business around using. Uh, no resources or using uh, uh, negative resources. We should say they contribute resources as a, as a result of their services. When you're running a sustainability project, and let's say it's for an ONG or NGO, uh, you're doing it in a, in a developing world. What are the kinds of things that make that sustainability project work, have traction? 
in the local space. Design for development is, is a well-established field at MIT, and, and I was inspired a lot by uh, the, the D-Lab, which is the development uh, technology lab at MIT. And what they showed very early was that uh, technologies that work in, in one part of the world do not work in another. The resources aren't there, neither the, uh, the material resources or, or the, the human uh, resources. And so you have to really get to know your user, and you have to really get to know your local conditions. And, and we've seen uh, just recently Facebook announced that it was going to launch a, a low bandwidth version of, of its tools uh, for that global audience that, that has uh, principally a mobile phone to interact with the internet. We're basically encouraging students to do the same thing for most of their uh, technologies. They're not allowed to make a business that will only work in Europe and North America. Uh, and if they can make something that works for all 7 billion people and, and is accessible conceivably, uh, th then they win. Where do you get your inspiration or where do you see the most innovation happening in sustainability around the world? Our inspiration are those development projects in uh, Latin America, Southeast Asia, uh, and Africa. That's where we get our inspiration. In fact, uh, at SourceMap, we uh, basically develop what I call sort of ERP or supply chain management software for, for the jungle. Uh, we, we, we try to say, how can you take all the, the, the resources that are available to a major multinational, you know, real-time data, track and trace, uh, high, high quality, and, and, and have it available to somebody who doesn't have a landline, doesn't have a server, and, and only has access to a pretty simple Android device. And, and by and large, you can do it. Uh, I mean, there was a project uh, at this year's NetExplo, the, the Ebola Sense follow-up, right, where they were able to stem the, the, the spread of Ebola in Nigeria through simple uh, mobile phone app that was used to track the social network, the contacts of affected people. Uh, that, that's exactly what, what we're continuously trying to do is how do you take existing technologies and make them vastly more impactful by getting to understand the local uh, context and the local users and the local problems. To what extent is data and data management an integral part of making sustainable projects work? Data is the, uh, the beginning and the end of every company these days. So, so when I talk about triple bottom line accounting, that's just more data. Uh, we work in a number of uh, developing countries with major multinationals who are sick of just throwing money at development projects without any real data to show their impact. Uh, and for many years, NGOs, development banks have done that. They, they will invest a tremendous amount in, let's say, uh, agricultural training, and they'll get a report at the end on, a, on paper, and that's it. And then they'll go somewhere else and do something similar. Uh, but companies won't take that uh, because they, they need to know, uh, because they're used to it uh, at the office, at the factory, that they need to know that you know, one dollar invested in this kind of training will yield you know, exactly you know, two dollars of, of extra value. Uh, they need to see those metrics. And so we basically use data as the, the, the foundation. And you can't pitch a business if you don't know how much money it's going to make. And, and by the same argument, you can't pitch a product if you can't show that it's going to you know, use less carbon, it's going to use less energy, it's going to be usable by more people, and it's going to bring, uh, bring livelihood benefits that are quantifiable to those people. You're somewhat geeky, Leo. And we've got these new technology around here. To what extent has digital changed the way we do sustainability? Digital has brought tools such as social networking, which allow you to be instantly in contact with hundreds of millions of people around the world. And that means that uh, you're accountable, if you're a company, to your consumers, but it also means you're accountable to your supply chain. And it means that at any given time, you can also benefit from their, their feedback to you. Uh, and that's something completely revolutionary. Like we've never seen people be conscious of things that happen so far from them and of the, the indirect consequences of their actions. Uh, and we take advantage of that know-how uh, to, to improve the, the way we measure impact and, and to improve the way we deliver goods. To what extent has what I would characterize as increased transparency developed greater accountability? One of the business cases I teach is a company in Holland called Fairphone. And they are a uh, company that is trying to make a more equitably traded uh, cell phone. Uh, smartphone and uh, I teach that business case because they've used Kickstarter to uh, start their company so basically they knew that consumers wanted a fair cell phone before 
they even started to develop it. And then they use those same consumers um, as, as uh, judges of whether they're being sustainable enough in their business practice. And in fact, they keep engaging that very captive customer base uh, through social media uh, at every step of the design and development and manufacturing process. And, and the reason we teach this business case is to say, you don't need to be Apple to make a cell phone these days. You can be 50 people in an office in Amsterdam, but you need to already have a thousand times or 10,000 times that many people invested in your vision and your idea. So the vision, in many cases, is all the marketing you ever need. It also ensures you a brand loyalty uh, unlike any other. Uh, and that's the lesson of, of Fairphone, and I think, uh, I think a lot of our students have taken advantage of that. They know that if they have a mission behind their product, it's going to sell better, and they're going to get uh, notoriety for it. A lot of businesses, as you mentioned before, have already sustainable departments, people responsible. For those that are truly on intent on driving the sustainable project, and the sustainable agenda, what are some of the best practices or tools that you can recommend for them to put in place for it to really move forward? Uh, the most important thing is not to treat sustainability as being separate from operations. Okay. Too often, uh, sustainability is only talked about uh, in, in a, a corporate social responsibility context as kind of a marketing or public relations effort. Uh, the companies that we see succeed have sustainability built into their operations. They have sustainability built into their procurement. And, and they see it as strategic uh, advantage for business continuity. So for companies these days, sustainability and business continuity are the same thing. Right? If you can't ensure that you're using a resource sustainably, you can no longer be sure that it'll be around next year. It used to be we thought in a 10 or 20 or 30 year cycle, but now we've seen commodities uh, disappear off the planet one year to the next. We saw companies lose track of rare earth minerals. We saw uh, cotton supplies go down by 10, 20, 30 percent. We've seen cocoa do the same. Uh, companies realize that they need uh, to know what environmental risks they're facing today uh, and they need to put plans in place today because many of those plans will take years to, to bear fruit. A lot of times we know there's an issue. We know smoking is not good for you, and yet we will continue to do it. We don't change the behavior. What kinds of things need to happen in order for a company that knows it's important to make the, the behavior changes happen in the organization? We try to uh, basically train a new generation of internal activists at companies. Okay, we try to equip students with the metrics they will need to show how uh, social environmental concerns will impact the bottom line. Right, can you put a dollar value on your water risk in 2017? You can, and, and, but you won't get management to notice you unless you can. Uh, and so we give them the tools, or at least we point them in the right direction, so that they should know that these are the ways to talk to, to business and these are the ways to shift business. And, and we've seen it work. Uh, we've seen companies that are able to put a dollar value on uh, the use of forced labor in the supply chain. And they can say to management, look, if, we, if people you know, are, are underpaid to work for us, it will have this much of an impact on the turnover in the sweatshops. It will have this much of an impact on uh, the, the, the marketing that we have to spend to overcome it. And uh, I know I'm speaking uh, frankly, but as long as you can put dollars to uh, these risks, people will put dollars to, to prevent them. And that's what we, we try to get our students to be able to do. What's the why of sustainability for you, Leo Bonani? You know, sustainability is, is about accountability, right? If, uh, if you do business and you don't know what impact you caused to get the raw materials, and you don't know what impacts you're causing to your consumers, you're going to run afoul of, of people and countries and cultures, but, but you're also going to run out of business. Uh, it might take a while, uh, but we just don't think that's an appropriate way to start. So before you even start a, a product design, you need to present in our class what countries the raw materials will be sourced from, how you're going to make sure that they're sourced equitably and renewably, uh, and you need to show that uh, your customers benefit, whether they save time or, or they make money or they have access to new opportunities. And if you don't have the two sides of the equation figured out, we don't let you graduate.